Welcome to The Actor's Choice, where the actors and actresses have a chance to talk about themselves and their careers. Join us now for the next hour as we explore the marvelous industry of acting by actors and actresses from today's exciting show business world. And now, direct from Hollywood, here's your host, Ron Brewington. Hi, everybody. I'm Ron Brewington, and welcome to The Actor's Choice. Roll it, Tony. It's a happy house again. It looks happy. It's, it's a Peggy house. Ladies and gentlemen, my first guest today is the founder and CEO of Lamarco Brands, LLC. This is a Seattle, Washington-based brand management firm with interests in multiple industries, including media, entertainment, food and beverage, and consumer products. He's also the executive producer of nearly a dozen films. That's what we're going to talk about today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Courtney Lamarco. Thank you. Hi, Courtney. How are you doing? We had a little problem this morning. We, we the machine, my equipment didn't act right. We'll talk about that later. But yeah. welcome to the actor's choice. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, from what I've seen, you have an impressive credentials. It looks like you've had a great life, but you had to work for it, didn't you? Oh, yeah, since day one. And I don't know if it's impressive or uh, if I'm just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's for you to know and us to find out. <laughs> What's it like being an executive producer? Um, you know, you have to really wear a lot of hats and uh, be able to manage everything from the top to the bottom, you know, the large and the small details. There's no, you really have to be able to see the overall encompassing aspect of the project that you're involved in. And uh, it can be complicated sometimes, but it's, it's, uh, I love it. I see that you do. Uh, uh, recently, I had a friend of mine who was a businessman like you, and he, this was at the Pan, Pan African Film Festival. And I had a chance to meet this gentleman for the first time. He's now making the transition from non-EP to now EP. Okay. And I asked him, why'd you do that? So why did you do that? You've been a businessman. You know, um, the opportunity was there. And I'm the type of person who's always into a challenge. And I always want to try to uplift myself and, and achieve greater heights, so to speak. You know, I come from a very poverty-stricken background. I grew up in Section 8 housing and, you know, had uh, lived on government assistance when I was growing up. So any opportunity I can to actually, you know, further my life and benefit and, and you know, from uh, what business and these opportunities have to offer, I'm going to take advantage of. And I, I employ everyone else who has an opportunity like that to do exactly the same. Okay. Let's go back in time to 2016. Ooh. Your first job as a graphic designer for a, 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 a short drama thriller called The Foreverlands. Remember that? Oh, wow. <laughs> Take me back. <laughs> wow. Yeah, a lot's happened since then. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> a lot has happened, yeah. Yes. Um, but I was always, you know, I've, I've actually done a lot of design work before that project, but it was not centered in film or television. I did a lot of production work and actually a lot of uh, commercial video work for a lot of local businesses and some companies here in uh, Seattle, in the, the Seattle area. Okay. You, in 2018, you came out with a, this was your first IMDB EP credit. And the first time that you worked with Eric Bernard, he was also an EP. It uh -huh. was called, Blur, is that, let me see if I say this like Blurreds. Blurds. <laughs> yeah, Blurds is, a, Blurds is a really great comedy uh, written by a colleague of ours, Hank Bird. It's, it's very funny. Black Nerds is actually where the term Blurds comes from. But it's, uh, yeah, it's a short comedy, a series of shorts. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty good project. And we're, we're hoping to actually do some more. Okay. You also, from 2019 to 2021, you did The Hoarders. Yes. And we're actually still doing Hoarders. I'm actually wrapping up uh season 14 i took over oh it's been a while wow yeah i think i took over season 10 and we are wrapping season 14 right now gotcha. Gotcha. Um, well here comes the good one the year is 2022 how do you do you did a movie called free dead and alive 
that was probably one of the most challenging projects. Um, so my partner, Eric Bernard, he wrote and directed that. And that was his biggest film to date. Um, definitely is going to be doing more larger projects. But that was a production fiasco because we shot that in Texas. And I don't know if you remember, but in Texas, what was it, in March or something like that, February, Texas froze over. Yes. And everything shut down. The power went yeah. down. So we had our entire crew, <laughs> cast and crew stuck in this small town in Texas with no running water, <laughs> no electricity for a few days. And uh, the good thing about that, though, is everybody, everybody, you know what, they, they, they strapped up their boots and they all worked together and we became a family. They became a family on that project and they did whatever they needed to do to get the project done. And we made some really good uh, lifelong friends throughout that process. So, you know, you have people who have to go through a struggle together and they work together to come out of it. You have a different experience than if everything would have just been smooth sailing the entire time. So. In a way, you know, it was a blessing in disguise. We just happen to have a clip of Free Dead or Alive. Roll it, Tony. I'm going to be free for a free and dead. I'm not something to be sold. How great you could have been if you were born somewhere with opportunity. How much are you and your family willing to pay to get to America? Can you just do your mama a favor? Just meet with this man tonight. You're not gonna have to be hungry anymore. You're going to. Hmm. Wow, people act, people actually live like that. <laughs> we see. Oh, yeah. it's, it's unbelievable. You know, it's a really yeah. it's a um, heart wrenching story about a young woman trying to escape. She's been chased by the cartel in Central America. She's trying to get to the United States and yes. everything that ensues. And people actually go through that on a daily basis. So yeah, it's a very touching story. Jasmine Espada. That name sound familiar? Oh, I love Jasmine. <laughs> Jasmine's amazing. She <laughs> Wonderful lady. She's yeah, a co-producer, I understand, on this project. Yeah, and we're, we have a lot of projects we're going to be doing with Jasmine in the future. So, you know, I met her a little under a year ago, maybe. And um, yeah, there's a lot going on that we have in the, in the pipeline. So I'm excited to see what uh, we have in the future. Okay. We got just a few moments because we started late. Tony, can you go to item number uh, 14, some photos? And start with the first one. We'll take it there. You go. There you go. Look at that handsome oh. young man. <laughs> oh, I was wearing that suit, wasn't I? <laughs> oh, you were wearing it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, that was at the that was at the film premiere of Free Dead or Alive that we yeah. had. I want to say yes. about two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. It's been such a blur because so much has happened since then. But yeah, we had a really great turnout at the theater down there in Los Angeles, and um, it was great. You know, seeing the film on the on the big screen is it's quite an experience. Definitely an experience. Next photo, Tony. There you are. Uh, yes. Yes. So that's the panel that we had after the event. And you can see everyone. There's Eddie and uh, there's my partner, Eric, sitting right on, on the side. And uh, yeah, we had a really good time. Uh, you know, it was very informative. I was just really happy with the, the response that the viewers had to the film. Everyone had a really positive response. It was a lot of great feedback. And, you know, for this being Eric's, one of his biggest projects, it was it was just good to see him shine like that. Courtney, unfortunately, we're out of time. We got to bring you back again and make up for that time that we lost. You know how to get a hold of me. I certainly do, sir. I want to thank you very, very much for being our ghost today. Continued success in your numerous, I say again, numerous things. And my best to Jasmine and Sparta for setting up your appearance today. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Courtney Lamarca. Bless you. This is the Actors' Choice. I'm your host, Ron Brewington. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to let you know that we are asking our baseball squad to help us get former baseball player Kurt Flood into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Now, Kurt passed away January 20th, 1997. He was a husband of one of our wonderful guests, renowned actress Judy Pace. And all you got to do is call us up at our office, 213 349-3941. It's 213-349-3941. Ladies and gentlemen, we sincerely thank each and every one of you for being a part of this magnificent award for a great baseball player. Roller Downey, thank you. Hi, my name's Chris Sanguino, and I'm Peg's next door neighbor and friend. I'm the one that submitted the application for Peg to be on Borders. I, I have no idea how to clean something up this big. I'm 
Ladies and gentlemen, my next guest today is a very talented gentleman who wears many hats. Now, his screenplays have garnered awards and attention from international festivals and competitions. He has produced and executive produced over a dozen films with more than pre-preparation that he just came out with. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Eric Bernard. Eric, bless you. Nice, welcome to us. Nice to see you. Uh, thank, thank you so much for having me, Ron. Before we begin this interview, I got bones to pick with you, sir. You ready? <laughs> I'm ready. I, seriously, I most sincerely wish to thank you for your service to our country as a member of the United States Army and a pilot veteran. Thank you. Hey, it's my honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. I served tw almost 20 years in the Navy, over 20 years in the Navy. I know how you feel. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you have impeccable credentials as a filmmaker, sir. Uh, but you've done a lot of other things. But according to IMDb, you started out as an executive producer in 2015 in a short drama film called Fragile Storm. <laughs> <laughs> Takes you back in time. <laughs> it, 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 it does. I mean, Fragile Storm was a, a great film. Um, I remember watching it, the rough cut of that film, and I was uh -huh. really seeing um, so a master performance from Lance Henderson and, and um the director of that film, she was just, you know, amazing. She did a great job on that. And I remember, wow, I need to be a part of this. And, and you know, we, we helped, you know, with some completion funds to get it over the top. And, and it came out, you know, came out really, really well. I mean, it was one of my first experiences going down to L.A. for, for, the, for the red carpet event, you mm -hmm. know, where the film kind of premiered and, and won his award. And it was, it was pretty remarkable. Got you. Got you. But then in 2017, while still an EP, you started writing. It was your first writer credits on IMDb with a short film called "Get Up, Joe." <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was actually writing before, so so um, well, my journey I started out as a writer, you know, like, like overall. Because uh -huh. I started writing as an escape, you know. I, after I did my third tour, you know, I was having a little bit of trouble, you know, coming back and, and finding that 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 reset button. And I started writing to kind of you know calm down a little bit. And I was fortunate; the army actually paid for me to go to SCAD on my lunch break. I went to SCAD, took writing classes. And my first teacher was uh, Michael Nolan, uh, who produced Mr. Holland's Opus, a great guy. Mm -hmm. My second teacher was uh, Engel, uh, David Engelbach, who, who wrote Over the Top, you know, and, and some other, you know, great stuff. And these, these two, two men, you know, were really great in, in teaching me how to be a, you know, a good screenwriter. So I started out there and I actually won my first award for a script I wrote in one of their classes, you know, and, and then from there, you realize no one likes to read. And then, <laughs> so I learned how to produce and, and learn how to make, make films so I could figure out how to get more things I wrote, you know, into production. Gotcha. So then in 2017, that writer's credit was a, a favor to a friend of mine mm -hmm. who I was looking to do a short film. Another veteran had a great story. And um, so I helped write that script and, and I think they went out and filmed it. Okay. The following year, 2018, you started directing. Your first project was No More Running and still an EP. <laughs> <laughs> That's that, yeah. That, that one was, was um, that was my first thing I, I, I ever did when I got out of the military. So I knowing, knowing you, you plan on being a filmmaker or you're gonna be a filmmaker is one thing, but then actually doing is another. And you have to invest time in yourself to learn the craft and get you, get, give yourself some reps. That was my first rep as a director. And, um, you know, I, I learned a lot. You know, it was a really, really good story, I thought. And uh, I think that was written by Tracy Beebe, you know, a good, a good friend of mine. And, um, and um, it turned out to, to be something I would kind of, you know, help me feel a little bit better about moving forward um, as a filmmaker, as a director, especially. I saw the name Denise Bernard. Relation? Yeah, that's that's my significant other. You know, she, she's the one that's helped me uh, finance these films. And and kind of been my supporter. She's also a veteran too, as well. Yeah, so she she she's on the team. Excellent. She got her first on this move. She got her first IMDb EP for the short film. Definitely working as a team. That's beautiful. I understand she now has five producer credits and growing and growing. It's marvelous to see people growing, growing, growing. Particularly. Okay. Yeah, it was 2018. You met a fellow by the name of Courtney Lamarco. We both guys got EPs. A TV movie called Blues. <laughs> 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 yeah that's a that's a funny story because a lot of times as as in the beginning of my career as a filmmaker i was a writer you know and I'm, i got pcs and you know 
permanent change of station, moved to different locations. And, and when I moved to Seattle, I was um, out of uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord in Tacoma. Yes. And I was still trying to connect to the film. So I would drive an hour one way every night, not every night, like at least twice a week to go to a writer's meetup. And I would do meetups everywhere to find other filmmakers. And just so happened, I went to one meetup and Courtney was hosting it. It was a Northwest Film Forum meetup. And, and then, you know, I, I met him and, and you know, it, he was really looking for someone like me and I was looking for someone like him. So it kind of worked out really well for us. If you'll take a moment, sir, tell our listeners and viewers, what is an EP? We hear that word bounced around all the time. What does that mean? Well, in film, an EP is usually someone that brings resources, whether it be funding, connections, or, 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 or actors to uh, the film, you know, it's a, which you know, has a value that the film would not be made without, a value that the film needs to be made and be made well. In TV, uh, executive producers is a little different. In TV, we're supervisors of all the other producers. So executive producer is, is in charge of, of, you know, the whole production from the top. So, so it's a little bit of a different responsibility. You know, as, as EP in film, you could give money and walk away and mm -hmm. come to the, the red carpet. And in TV, you're more obligated to see the whole production from start to finish um, to make sure it's delivered on time to spec and, you know, and in accordance with whatever budget you have allocated for it. So it's a little bit more detailed in TV, I think, executive producer. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Definitely. Oh, fast forward to 2019, and there you and Courtney are working together again this time, a TV series documentary called Holders. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. And we actually started working on that in 17. And um, that, that's, a, that's a, a story that, that will take us all day to kind of see how that landed. But Courtney, Courtney ended up in a situation where he was going to produce the show, and, he, and that was the first call he made, you know, from that meetup we had. And... and um, and, you know, Courtney's kind of been like my big brother in, in that regard. And uh, he called me up and said, hey, I got something for us. And I just got the military. My wife's chirping in my ear saying that you may not, you may have to go get a real job, you know, that kind of thing. And, and, and then uh, he calls me with that and we, we take off. You know, we, we're, 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 I think we've produced over, over 40 episodes now. You and Courtney started your own business called TLG Motion Pictures. You're, he was the founder. You were the CEO. Yeah, no, he founded the company and, and brought me on to, to manage the day-to-day. -day. Uh -huh. So, you know, I, um, what I like about Courtney is that uh, Courtney understands that I'm driven by a need to, to produce content. You know, I'm a filmmaker. And, and Courtney's more like a, a mobile. You know, he's a guy that, that he builds systems, you know. So he's able to, to build these great systems for us to operate in and make sure that we have the admin support, logistic support, and uh, the financial support to kind of, you know, really thrive in them. So it works out really well because he founded TLG Motion Pictures. And realized he needed someone he can trust to kind of run the day-to-day -day that wasn't going to call him with a thousand problems, that was going to be able to take some risks and have some, some, some initiative. So he brought me on to manage it. I've been managing it since then. We've seen so much change in the industry. There was a time when only a certain amount of people were seeing movies. Now there's so, everybody's got one. Break your little machine out. I got a movie. <laughs> it's very true. I think, and, and everyone's a critic too. Everyone, oh, everyone's God, an expert yes. on, on film and they, they, they'll, they'll question your plot. Your, uh, your decisions and stuff, your arcs. I mean, it's really good though to see such, such uh, one thing I think has happened with the streaming platforms is that everyone's become more sophisticated in, in their viewing. I mean, even if people that are viewing for, for just you know, action or, or a very simple genre where they don't have to think a lot, they're still able to watch it now and identify you know, just major, major filmmaking you know, little details that normally I think that no one really cared about you know, years ago. So it's really interesting to watch the filmmakers today. I think, I think they're, they're a lot tougher crowd to please, but, the, but also that they're, they're very fair in, in, in their assessment of things. Interesting. Interesting. I teach broadcasting over the local college here in town and getting students in there to get them to understand how to say certain things. Break one nine for a smoky. You know, they said, what is that? I said, that's broadcasting, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Been a good I'm sorry. This has been a good year for you guys. You were the director, writer, and producer for the action film, Free, Dead, or Alive. Yeah, that's correct. Tell us about that, sir. Well, Free, Dead, or Alive was a story that I wrote um, eight years ago, believe it or not. And um, it was one of three films I wanted to make to, to, to kind of offer some some support to, to, to women that may be in a, an oppressive, you know, environment. Yeah. So, um, and this was, the, this was the, the first one I wrote, you know, this is the one I, I, I wanted to create these two characters that were born in, in some you know, incredible poverty, 
but also born with a, a fire as, as survivors, you know, people that couldn't be easily conquered. And her mom, you know, created a, a daughter that was a one in a million daughter, a daughter that had all the strength and conviction, but also had great compassion and sensitivity and wanted to change the world. And, and now we see her, you know, pushed into uh, an amazing journey where that passion has led her into, you know, probably the most dangerous, you know, setting, but also created a tremendous opportunity for her to be free and to, to pursue things that were normally lost in, in, in resource stricken, you know, places where you, you don't have the luxury of love and, or even time to, to really figure yourself out. You know, you have to immediately jump into the workplace and, and really assume responsibility and tasks for things that you may not want to do, but you need that to survive. So like to find a woman that's willing to, to survive on her own terms is, is, is pretty much what Free Dead Alive is about. You got, you got the opportunity with a lot of ideas. Where do you get your ideas from? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I don't know where they come from. I, I'm, I, I think sometimes I, I can watch uh, um, a movie and see a, see a character or a different character, or I can think of another character. I think, I think a lot of my mom is in this movie. My mom was a single mom. I think that a lot of, a lot of her little sayings and, and mannerisms made into this film because, you know, she, she, she's the kind of character I think that would um, be a, the tough mother that instills a you know tremendous value to the daughter. So I, I, I think, you know, in short, the world around me, I guess, is, is where I pull most of my most of my ideas from. Okay. We just happen to have a clip of free deer and the lion, dead and alive. Roll it, Tony. For this one. She's a woman money can't buy. She's one in a million. You called my father. I trust our arrangement remains in place. Where are you going? To America. Do you have a coyote? This will pay for your passage into America. Everybody follow me. Hey! Just saw your name go across the screen there. Thank good work. Good work, sir. Let's see. Courtney was the EP. Javin Spada was the co-producer. Denise uh, Bernard was the producer. Good bunch of people got together. Definitely. Definitely. Um, you are doing, you just completed some work, uh, Red Runners. Yeah, that was an older project. Um, that was a TV movie we worked on a few years ago. Uh -huh. That was, that was, that was, that was part of, the, that was my second short. That, that, that was a, a learning experience. I mean, I brought on a whole bunch of kids from, uh, film school kids. And we, we yes. decided to make, try and shoot a pilot. And, um, yeah, we ran into to, to a few obstacles, you know, so, so, so that one was another learning block for us and on this journey of filmmaking. You know, um, we, we ended up with, with something truly remarkable in terms of style, but, but you know, it, it wasn't enough substance to really, really meet our intent though, in terms of uh, the, the, the TV series that we hope to, to launch. Okay. Last question, how competitive is the competitiveness in this business? It's very competitive. I mean, um, I woke up this morning at 5 a.m. this morning, you know, I'm, and I'm gonna go to bed tonight at midnight. It's, 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 it's you know, something you have to be willing to, to grind it out. And unfortunately, you know, most of the time you get ahead is when, you know, you're working and no one else is working because they're sleeping. So you have to be willing to, to embrace that challenge and, and really, you know, get better. And also you have to, to be competitive and compete. You have to be able to fail fast. Sometimes you have an idea, you can't sit in your idea. You can't sit in that asset. You think it's gonna be worth something and not test it out because before you know it, you'll um, be in a situation where you finally got your shot and you're calling in favors and people that you think that are gonna be um, as efficient as, you, as they articulated to you. And, and you're gonna find out that they're not ready for that moment. So a lot of it is, is being able to know who's in your circle, know what they can do, test them, vet them, make sure they can deliver what they say they can. And also just trying something out and, and seeing if it works or not. Sometimes, you know, something you think is gonna be perfect in your mind, puts your situation to fail. You gotta fail fast and you gotta fail what no one can see. <laughs> And, and, and that's the key to winning, I think, and, and being, uh, being competitive in this business. Thank you for those words. So I hope a lot of people will listen to them and take advantage of it. Eric, thank you very much for being here today. I know you got a lot of super information from you. And thanks to Jasmine Spot for making your appearance here today. Wow. Ladies and thank gentlemen, you, Ron. My pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, Eric Bernard. This is the, the Actors' Choice. I'm Ron Brewington. Roll it, Tony. Two, ready, and... There's no such place as sugar candy, Martin. Animals are slaughtered and then converted into pork or mutton pies which are guzzled down the throats of men. There's no such place as sugar candy, Martin. When you die, you die!
Ladies and gentlemen, my next guest today is the producing artistic director at the What With A Noise Within Classic Theater. Now, under her leadership, ANW, as they call it, is the theater called, produced more than 175 works. That's a lot of work. In addition, she has directed 50 productions, including an, an Iliad, Henry V, A Tale of Two Cities, Here, King Lear, and many, many others. Now, she's here today to talk about a new season calendar performances. So, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Julia Rodriguez Elliott. Greetings, Julia, and welcome to the Access Choice. Thank you for having me. My pleasure, my dear. My pleasure. When I found out that you what you do, I said, stage, oh, that's my that's my girl. That's my girl. We take it from here. We take it from here. <laughs> Impressive. It works now. What got you into what you do now? Well, I was always interested. I, I I started with dance. That was really my my first engagement in the arts, and then became very interested and involved in theater when I was probably a senior in high school. And then uh, in college, first discovered Shakespeare and uh, fell in love with Shakespeare. So my training was really as an actor, and I ended up going to the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco and did graduate work there and fell in love with the theater and uh, moved to LA as often actors uh, do who are in the theater. You either choose Los, a Los Angeles or New York. And I, uh, and I somehow ended up in LA and uh, was lucky enough to have opportunities uh, to work in film and television and you know, particularly with commercial work uh, and so missed the theater. And the and the opportunities to to perform on stage, and so really, it 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 was one of those things where a group of friends got together and said, "Hey, kids, let's put on a show," uh, and we put on a production of Hamlet, and that really started us on the 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 a noise within journey, if you will. Uh, what's that expression? To be or not to be? That's right. That's, That's right. <laughs> I take it that you put a lot of time into what you do. Yes, it's it's what what we do in the arts is is very gratifying, very satisfying, and it's very labor intensive. So so without a doubt, a lot of effort, and certainly the journey of going from uh, a small uh, organization as we were at at the time to to building an institution uh, has a lot of interesting challenges uh, along the way. All, all of them ultimately worth it because we are very proud of uh, the organization we've been able to build and the community that we've been able to build around it and this beautiful facility in Pasadena, which has been a wonderful uh, home for us and community. Now, you're the uh, co-person, artistic director. There's yes. another person that works with you. What his name is? His name is Jeff Elliott, and we're still married, if you can believe it. <laughs> Tony's got a picture. I'm sure he's gonna put that picture so you can see you and him together. <laughs> <laughs> when I when I uh, share with people that I that I work with with my yeah. husband and the level of intensity, uh, given that it's a nonprofit uh, arts organization, there he is. There he is. There, there he is. There There's he that is. handsome young man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're often horrified. Um, for us, it's just something that has always um, worked. We we. Uh, are passionate about the theater. We we trained. We met in undergraduate school. We went to the American Conservatory the Theater together. So it's always been very much a part of our lives, and we're lucky that we are able to to work together and uh, see the art in 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 similar and, and yet different ways that are that are um, uh, that are very energizing for both of us. I believe. Okay. Um. See, so you have they have you listed a cinematographer and editor. That's not correct, but uh, and so you're an artistic director. Um, how did you get the name? Your organization get the name A N W. A noise within. Yes. It is a stage direction that appears in a number of Shakespeare's plays. Okay. Specifically for us, as I mentioned before, our very first production was was a uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet. Yeah. And it is a stage direction that appears uh, in Hamlet. And I remember that we were uh, sitting around the table reading the play for the first time. And my husband circled that stage direction and he pointed to it. I was sitting next to him and he said, what about this? <laughs> Thanks, Don. 
Right. And so there you have it. And I, I love it. what it's what it says that it's it's also about that creative impulse that we all have within us that that wants to find expression. All right, find that expression. <laughs> That's right. It was a happy accident. <laughs> Your organization has an annual Christmas tradition called a Christmas Carol. Please tell us about it. Christmas Carol is a beautiful um, a story of, of transformation uh, mm -hmm. written by Charles Dickens. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us, it's an opportunity to share uh, that story with our with our community that 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 time of year. I believe that our production is unique in that uh, it's not a Courier and Ives production, if you will. So it has appeal for both adult audiences and young audiences. It's, it's very visual uh, and um, it's a little unexpected, I would say, but still retaining the, the beautiful words of, of Charles Dickens. It's, it's all his words. We, we, have, we haven't added a single um, um, wor word to it, just all straight out of the novel. Got you. I understand it's uh, many of the cast members return to perform to the same roles. They do. Most of them do, uh, uh, unless it, it is no longer age appropriate and then they move <laughs> on to, <laughs> to other roles. So, you know, Tiny Tim grows up and things yes. like that. <laughs> uh, but it's a beautiful uh, coming together. And I think that we all look forward to uh, retaining, uh, returning to the essence of the spirit of, of the season with that production. Julia, I noticed that you have some youth programs. Can you tell us about that? Yes, our organization uh, has very robust education programs. We serve anywhere between 18 to uh, 20,000 students annually. And those come from uh, between 24 to 25 different school districts. We work with over 200 schools. So the reach is, is, is far it's far reaching uh I, I will say and uh our primary focus really is getting students to come in and experience the plays you know in person in the environment that they were intended uh to be performed we do have other programs we go into schools and we do residencies and uh workshops we have professional training for teachers etc all with the goal of bringing students in to experience the art ouch when you said experience, you made me think of something that I say to my students all the time. It's what I call the three E's, education, exposure, and experience. That's what Absolutely. You and uh, I experienced the, uh, the, um, the works of, of Shakespeare, you know, late in that I, I saw them for the first time when I was in high school. I saw my first Shakespeare play live and, and I made a commitment once we started A Noise Within that I wanted students to have that experience and see themselves in these stories much earlier than I had had the opportunity to. Okay, Julia, I like what I, when I saw you, what well, pitch that your organization put out. Here it goes, ladies and gentlemen. Play your part. If you are inspired by the work on stage and believe in the power of classic theater to transform communities, act now and consider making a tax deductible donation to a noise within. Beautiful. Ron, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> I take the job. Two dollars and seventy-five cents an hour. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's so true. Uh, we we can't do it without the support uh, yes. of our com our community. So yes. so that is critical to the to the success of the organization. You came here today to talk about a season, twenty twenty two to twenty twenty three season. What's how long is it going to last? Tell us those days, please. The season, our very first preview is right around the corner. In fact, I go into tech rehearsals for Animal Farm tomorrow. Okay. Uh, and we open Animal Farm. The first preview is August the 28th. And the season runs through uh, June, the first week of June, I believe. And we have a, a wonderful uh, slate of plays this season. Okay. Tell us about a little of that so they can look in advance in the future. So we're opening the season with George Orwell's Animal Farm, and this is a musical uh, version of it, uh, adapted by Sir Peter Hall, and it was first performed at the National Theater. Then that is followed by August Wilson's Radio Golf, and our organization has made a commitment to presenting the entire uh, American Century Cycle. Uh, so this will be our third August Wilson play. 
We talked about Christmas Carol, and that happens in December. January, uh, we will be performing William Shakespeare's extraordinary comedy, Much Ado About Nothing, followed by Manuel Quigg's Kiss of the Spider Woman. And finally, we close the season with Lauren Gunderson's The Book of Will, which is a, a wonderful story of uh, how the Shakespeare's players put together essentially the first folio. Now, if people come out all the time, do they get a discount? That come all the time? Absolutely. If you become a subscriber, there are wonderful passes that you can purchase that uh, provide, uh, if you love having your same seat every time you come to the theater, there's a package for you if you prefer the flexibility of coming to one show, uh, two shows, three shows. We have these wonderful flex passes that, for instance, you can buy a flex pass that has five tickets and you can use them all to see one show or you can come to two shows. So it's so it's so uh, it provides maximum flexibility for patrons. Go for it. Go for it. Uh, when we started this interview, we showed a short video of Animal Farm, a rehearsal going on right now. They have been doing some great, great work. We have another video that's called, it's a time lapse of the building. They were building the set of Animal Farm. Tony, can you roll that one for us, please? Wow, that's marvelous. I love that. So much work goes into it that all, and it comes up so quickly, right? <laughs> right. How many seats do you have in your theater? We see 325. That's better than 99. <laughs> that's, that's... Yes, and it's, and it's a very intimate experience. We always, uh, my husband and I made a commitment to the importance of the intimacy of the space and for us to be able to have uh, a conversation with our audiences. So hence, the thrust stage, which has audience members on all three sides and the pr proximity uh, to the stage for our audience and that actor audience relationship is really wonderful in that space. Uh, Julie, as I was looking at some information that uh, uh, was given to me by Ms. Pollock, Lucy Pollock, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, I, I saw this, I said, this is beautiful. I'm talking about post-show conversations with the public, the actors, can you talk about that please? Yes, there are certain uh, performances that include a post-show conversation, and it it's exactly what it sounds like. The actors come out right after a performance. The the audience members uh, who wish stay in the audience, and it's a an opportunity to talk about process, to talk about the play, to uh, engage in in ideas and. Uh, the actors get as much out of it as I believe as the audience does in that it's uh, an opportunity for them to, to get a sense of how the play and the story and the themes in the story are landing with our audience. So there's some lively uh, conversations depending on the play that we're producing. Okay, again, can you tell us the location of, of the theater? Oh gosh, I hope I remember. <laughs> yes, 3352 <laughs> East Foothill Boulevard in Pasadena. Pasadena. And for those who live in the area, if I say it's right across the street from Bed Bath and Beyond, everyone knows where it is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just can feel it in the in the air. Uh, it's just in the air uh, what's happening at this, at this theater. Uh, how do we get tickets? You can call the box office uh -huh. or you can go to our website at www.anoisewithin.org. So that's www.anoisewithin.org. And there you will find lots of information on the plays that we're presenting, on tickets, on subscriptions, and, uh, and phone numbers to call if, uh, if you need assistance. Wow. Now, how many people are in the cast? Our cast is a cast of 11, plus we have three musicians, so all in it, 14. What did, who was the director by any chance? <laughs> some, 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 some strange woman called <laughs> Julia. <laughs> okay, strange woman, you're doing fine. It's, it's marvelous. 
artistic directing is something that is marvelous. You have to work with people and give and take. And it's just so many beautiful things in watching. You know, when you see a lot of people who become uh, actors, uh, sometimes members of their family will say, how come you want to be an actor? How come you can't be a lawyer? Ooh, ooh, ooh. What do you tell them then? Well, mm -hmm. it just requires so many skills. It's funny you should say that because my, my, my father would say, oh, such a shame. You're such a smart girl and you have so much potential. <laughs> <laughs> Pops, the lady. So that, just, that tells you a little bit about it. Uh, I think that regard, I think that arts education is so important and, and particularly in the theater uh, because it, it builds community. And for young people, it also gives them an opportunity to find to find who they are, how to express themselves, how to work with other people, how to, um, you know, empathy, you know, having empathy for others. When, when you take on a play, you're, you, you have to look at different perspectives and different ways that different people see the world. So, so what I would say to most parents is, it doesn't matter. Your child may go on to be a lawyer. Your child may go on to do something else. Or your child may decide to uh, to live in the theater. But regardless, those are 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 skills that will go with him no, them no matter what they do. Julia, thank you so very very much. We got one more slide to show show you. This one I saw this. Uh, look at that. Look at look at that. Look, <laughs> animal farm. The noses. The noses. <laughs> And it couldn't be more relevant. So it's a wonderful <laughs> evening at the Theater Animal Farm. It's just a, a play that, even though it was written in 1945, it's very much of the moment. Gotcha. Dates, one more time, the dates, please. Uh, first preview is August 28th, and it closes, no, it closes October 2nd. Outstanding. Julia, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, classic theater ain't nothing so good. And please do come back again. We can do more. We got more to talk about. We only have 17 minutes, but, and of course, much thanks to publicist Lucy Pollock. So thank you so much. I wish you well out there and what you're going to do with this play. Thank you, Ron. Appreciate you having me. And give my best to your husband, please. I will. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. I want to thank our sponsors, Harvey Bram and Photography as an Art. Ron Irwin's Lose Life, Way to Lose Weight. Larry Buford's book to the future, time travel message in a capsule. State Farm agent Carla Green and veteran actor Rob Brownstein's actor training school and actor space. And much, much thanks to our guest today, producer, actor, Courtney Lee Marco, director, writer, producer, Eric Bernard, and producing artistic director, Julia Rodriguez Elliott. Of course, it's most special thanks to our ever-growing audience. Ladies and gentlemen, be well. We'll see you the next time.